let's see if it's okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this evening's program. We're thrilled that you've all been able to join us. Uh, my name is Lauren Cristella. I'm the Chief Program Officer at the Committee of 70. I'm also the President of the League of Women Voters of Philadelphia. And I think uh, just a few hours ago, we thought this program was gonna look one way and given uh, the recent news of the verdict coming down in the George Floyd case, uh, I think it's gonna provide a different lens on the same still very important issue of the national popular vote. So I'm glad you've carved out this time to, to be with us and be in community uh, at a time when we probably all need that. So thank you uh, for joining us. Joining me tonight are two uh, terrific uh, public servants who have uh, really done their homework on the issue of the national popular vote. And they're here to educate us and get us more informed about the things we can do to make sure that people are represented by their government, right? That the, that the majority is represented and that the minority rights are protected and that that happens when our votes matter. Uh, and tonight we have Representative Chris Rabb representing the 200th district of Philadelphia County. Um, Representative Rabb has been a terrific friend of the Committee of 70 and has helped us for everything from recruiting poll workers to uh, educating young people and all kinds of good things. Uh, we're thrilled to have him with us. He's also a father, an educator, an author, and a social justice activist. And I, I so look forward to your thoughts this evening, Representative Rabb. Thank you so much for joining us. And we also have Beth Goldstein Huxon here. She is an educator and she's gonna educate us tonight, which we're just thrilled. Um, she is a passion for democracy and good government and for getting people involved in this work. And she's gonna share some really important information with all of us. Uh, please feel free to write uh, comments in the, the chat. We'll be monitoring that and passing that along to, to both Rep Beth and Representative Rab. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, uh, I, thought, I, thought, I thought I thought Representative Rob was going to go first. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. totally fine going first. One I, I was waiting for Beth's fantastic slides. So oh, let's okay, <laughs> here we go. So uh, let me get this set up. Okay, this is just going to take me one moment. I apologize. Uh, here we go. I am sharing my screen. And here we go. So uh, I, I certainly hope everyone can see this. Please tell me you can. Yes? OK, good. So I, I actually want to start um, with, a, with a small story. I want to talk, talk about my dad. When I was a kid growing up, um, my dad voted in every election. You know, of course he voted for president and for member of, Com of Congress and for a senator, but he also voted for state representative and tax assessor and school board member and dog catcher. If there were two people running for an office, no matter how big or small it was, my dad would do his research and he would make a selection and he would drag his butt to the polls and go and vote. And he used to say to me, he used to say that um, voting was both a privilege and a responsibility of citizenship. And, and you know, he's right. There's something really special and really beautiful about that. Um, but my dad doesn't live in suburban New York anymore. Now he lives in the hill country of Texas. My dad's a Democrat and he'll probably still vote uh, and he'll definitely vote for tax assessor and county executive, but he's not so excited to vote for president anymore. He says to me, he says, you know, Beth, uh, why should I bother? Texas is going for the Republican and all of Texas's electoral college votes are going to the Republican. And, 
he says, you know, my vote, my vote just doesn't matter. It, it doesn't make a difference. And he's not the only one who says that. I have, I have friends that are Republicans in California and they feel the same way. I have friends that are Democrats in Louisiana. I have, I have a cousin who's a Republican in New York and they all say the same thing. They feel like their vote doesn't matter. Their voice doesn't count. And they're not wrong. And my, my dad used to say to me, sometimes he'll say, you know, Beth, it would be different if it was proportional. It would be different if, um, you know, 40% of Texans voted for Joe Biden, so Joe Biden would get 40% of Texas's electoral college votes. But that's not how it works. That it, it just isn't. And it, it, it used to be, kind of that way, it used to be more proportional. You know, the, the constitution mandates that we have an electoral college, but it doesn't mandate how those electoral college votes are allocated. As a matter of fact, in article two, it, it very specifically says to the states, it says, hey, states, you're gonna get electors, figure out how you will apportion and award them. And uh, in the beginning, it used to be district by district, which wasn't exactly proportional, but it was a lot closer than it is now. And a quirk of history uh, and states figured out that they could have sort of this partisan advantage if they changed how they awarded their electors, if they went from district by district to winner take all. And one by one, they moved to winner take all. And when you have all these states that are winner take all, what happens is votes, like my dad's vote in Texas doesn't count. In 2020, 5.2 million Texans voted for Joe Biden. They don't count. Six million Californians voted for Donald Trump and they don't count either. Because what winner take all does is it turns us into this checkerboard, into this conglomeration of red states and blue states. But the truth of the matter is we're really America the purple. And what we want, what we need is democracy. What we need is a politics that incentivizes our politicians to hear all of us, to listen to all of us. We want it to be the case that wherever you're voting and whoever you're voting for, even if it's someone I don't like, even if it's someone you don't like, it counts equally. We should all count the same. We fix this by electing a president by majority rule. One person, one vote, anywhere in the United States, it all counts the same. And to do this, you know, we can't just get rid of the electoral college. It's in the constitution, but we don't need to get rid of the electoral college. Article two says states can do whatever they want with their delegates to the electoral college. They can award and apportion them however they see fit. So they certainly can join the national popular vote interstate compact. They can certainly decide that all their electoral college votes will go this way. And so, this is how we fix it, the national popular vote interstate compact. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a big chewy title, but it so perfectly expresses what it is. The national popular vote interstate compact, it's, it's a compact. It's an agreement between states, right? Interstate compact. And the states in the compact agree to give all their electoral college votes to whichever presidential candidate wins 
the national popular vote. So whichever candidate is the choice of most Americans will get all of a state's electoral college votes. There's a, a slight catch to this, um, that it doesn't, this, you know, there's currently, uh, I think, 16 jurisdictions that have signed on, and we, we currently have 196 electoral college votes in the compact, committed to the compact. But it doesn't become active until we have 270, until we have enough votes to win, until we have enough electoral college votes in the national popular vote interstate compact to guarantee that whatever candidate wins the national popular vote also wins the electoral college. And in November, 2020, uh, Representative Rob and nine co-sponsors introduced uh, House Bill 2922. And that's the bill that would allow mandate really, that Pennsylvania joins the compact and brings our currently 20 electoral college votes into the compact. And it's, it's a law just like any other law. So it has to pass both houses and then get signed by the governor. Um, and you could help, you can help us do this. You can, um, I, have, I have a Facebook page for Pennsylvanians for the national popular vote. Come join me. I post articles, I say things, you can say things. Um, go to the nationalpopularvote.com, sign up to receive updates. Help us out by calling your legislator and your state senator and, and letting them know you want America to elect a president the same way we elect every other office that the person with the most votes wins. And this has tremendous potential to moderate our politics by making sure that every voice is heard. So join me and hundreds of other people as we work to pass it here in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Beth. Uh, we appreciate that overview and anchoring it in real world experience. That's really terrific. Uh, hey, Representative Rep, uh, can we kick it over to you to talk about this being the first bill you introduced after being elected in 2016? Sure. You've continued to champion it. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm still processing the verdict. Um, I didn't know if I would be here in Harrisburg or I'd be driving back home to Philly. Um, and I'm reminded of how all of these issues are interconnected. Um, we're looking for more just institutions to honor the tradition of democracy, at least on paper, um, and it's an evolving thing. And only recently in my lifetime um, as a black person in the United States have I felt my concerns as validated and echoed than in the past just couple of years. Um, not even during the Obama administration but far more recently, where it is now socially acceptable and appropriate to identify white supremacy as a root cause of so many of the inequities that exist today. The same applies to patriarchy. Um, we can have an indictment of capitalism itself. Just the fact that we're able to have these conversations in good faith, not necessarily agreeing on everything, but able to use the very terminology that is at the 
core of a lot of the things that we are seeking to remedy through legislation, through advocacy, through grassroots mobilization is a seemingly radical thing that's now happening in mainstream society. And when I process the electoral college, and we think about the original intent, if you go back, you don't have to go back so far to understand that so many of these things were rooted in exclusion and an elitism that has evolved but not dissolved over centuries. Because we still, we still have elitism today. We have no greater wealth disparity just among white people today versus 100 years ago. We have greater downward mobility in this country than we have in generations. So the American dream, as George Carlin would say, you can only believe it if you're asleep. So it is incumbent upon me as an elected official who seeks to move forward this, this bill and have Pennsylvania be part of the solution so we can surpass could reach and surpass that 270 mark to not shy away of some very controversial, very difficult conversations. And these are conversations that I, I wouldn't feel comfortable having despite how strongly I felt about them because I felt that if I raised the issue, um, I would be put in a box oh, he's the angry black person. He is the aggrieved person of color. You know, here we go again. We can't, you know, what can't the history, you know, it's the past, we can't change history. You know, where we are today, let's put this uh, ideological stuff aside. And this is, this is distracting us from what the practical steps we need to get this done. And if we bring up controversial aspects of this, then our success will fail. So can we be quiet around stuff that deals with misogyny or homophobia or classism or racism? Because you know that's gonna scare some people and we need to come together and get this done. But if you get it done by excluding, by making it in, in, continuing the silence around the originating disease that has allowed for this to happen, we then become part of the problem. We then are complicit in do doing this. The real political courage is being able to have a conversation like this that may make folks feel a little uneasy, but to have the, the faith and the confidence that if we do it in good faith, we can get through this together that this is not an indictment of any one person or any one institution. This is something that afflicts a society awash in trauma. And it is not easy being a black elected official from Philadelphia, a hundred miles from home here in Harrisburg, saying things about institutions that up until very recently have been revered without any meaningful scrutiny from people in positions of power up until really last summer has there been a pluralistic condemnation or critique of modern policing. There have always been outcries uh, around police terror and, account and um, um, brutality since the 1870s. But how does it relate to what we're talking about tonight? This is about maintaining political power, concentrating political power in ways that make folks who are already in power feel safer. That's really what, what we're addressing. We're, we're addressing that. What made some people feel safer centuries ago is not what makes people feel safe today, I'd like to posit. Some people, yes, but most people know. There was a time when men 
believed that women did not have the capacity or the intellectual heft or the social standing or appropriateness to vote. In this state in Pennsylvania, free black men were allowed to vote until they revoked that right in 1838 with the, uh, an amendment to the state constitution. And we had to wait until 1870 to get that back through the 15th amendment. All of this is rooted in systems of oppression. And I wanna wrap it up by saying this because these are some very stark terms and um, my goal is not to, to be dour dis, despite the gravity of what's happened this evening. Um, I, I take no joy in this verdict tonight because it's an anomaly. It's an anomaly. But the lesson that I'm learning, particularly as a public servant in a state legislature that is so deeply partisan, so deeply partisan, that I have to find those glimmers of hope and those things that are truly transcendent of partisanship that will help everyone, irrespective of their political ideology, even though in the moment, what we are talking about is not nearly as bipartisan as it should in terms of its support, but that will change. And I want to end by saying this, <clears throat> I'm not an optimist by nature, but I know things can and will change and that they will change for the better. And how do I know that? Because I descend from 16 great, great grandparents who were born in six different states from as far south as Mississippi to as far north as New York City. And they were born into states where slavery was the state law. And all 16 of my great, great grandparents, all of whom were black, they all died free. Every single one of them died free, including this man right here, my great, great grandfather, Abraham Miller, who served in the Union Army in Kentucky, who was owned by his own grandfather and freed by his father. I do the work in honor of my ancestors and all of the people who have been marginalized through policy, through practice, through cultural practice for centuries. He probably never got a chance to cast a vote, even though on paper he was allowed to because of the state he was born in. I do this work because this is, this is institutional. This is foundational stuff we're talking about here. When we talk about greatness, when we talk about American exceptionalism, which I don't support, but it's something I'm very familiar with being an American. I think about it in the context of all the things we can do better that still honor what most of us accept as collective values in this society. And there's nothing about this legislation that inherently benefits one party over another, one demographic over another, one person, one vote. It is at the core of how we define democracy. And even though we're not where we'd like to be in Pennsylvania, we are moving in the right direction. And it may not happen this legislative term, but it will happen and it will happen because of all of you. And we have to keep our eyes on the prize and understand that there will be setbacks, but we will prevail because we are on the right side of history. So incredibly well said, Representative. Thank you so much for that. And, and taking off on that, you talked about the one person, one vote, who gets listened to and who candidates are, are listening to and who they're responsible to. And I hope that either you or Beth could, could talk about um, how the national popular vote would uh, change that would really affect who, who is really a, a, an active part of that national conversation. Do you wanna take it or, or? No, go for it. I just spoke a whole bunch and I'll just <laughs> follow up. 
Well, I mean, here's the thing. If we move to a national popular vote, you know, I lived in upstate New York for a long time. And New York is, is known uh, and appropriately as a blue state because it, it has always voted for the Democrat in a presidential election. But there are very red areas. And um, those people, their voice doesn't get heard and most of them aren't really all that psyched to go vote for president. There are very blue areas in my husband's native Louisiana. Um, there are very red areas in California and very blue areas in Texas. Actually, Texas is probably uh, without voter suppression, which is just evil. Um, Texas would be purple to blue. Um, so if we, in, if we incentivize uh, Amer Americans everywhere to vote, what we do is we incentivize politicians to, to listen to them. And the best model we have for this really is the way people run for statewide office. So if you can imagine like the entire United States is one big state and the president is sort of running to be the ultra governor, right? So when Tom Wolf was running to, to be governor here in Pennsylvania, he didn't just visit cities. And he didn't just visit uh, Democratic areas. He visited Republican areas. He visited, he was, he was at the farm show. Um, I saw him in front of Butter Gritty. Um, he was, he went everywhere. And he went everywhere and he listened to everyone because that's what you have to do if you want to get votes from everywhere. So I think that if we go to a national popular vote, not only will we get people coming out of the woodwork like my dad and my cousin in California and my friend in Louisiana, they're gonna come out of the woodwork and, and vote for president, but we're also gonna get presidential candidates who are really invested in listening to more people, listening to people who haven't spoken or have been silenced. Uh, so, so Representative Rabbit, how close is this bill to becoming a reality? And is the bill basically just this? It's saying, maybe just give us a little bit of an overview of exactly what it says, but I'm, I'm guessing it's that the, the proportional allotment of electoral college votes, right? Yeah, it would, it would uh, bring Pennsylvania into the interstate compact um, and it would uh, actually provide, um, it would actually give all the votes to whoever won the national popular vote. Uh, once we have enough states to uh, meet or surpass the 270 electoral vote um, threshold. Um, but here's, I, I heard from um, a colleague, um, a Republican colleague who had been on the bill uh, before I introduced it in 2016 and uh, expressed now that he has reservations about it, uh, that uh, presidential candidates would spend less time in Pennsylvania if we had, you know, one person, one vote, which I found very ego driven. Um, th that doesn't seem like a, a good or thoughtful response to why you shouldn't su <laughs> support this bill, that Pennsylvania was a swing state, a battleground state, so we get a lot of attention. And that makes some people feel very good. It helps their, you know, their fragile egos as elected officials and you know, folks with sharp elbows or whomever. I, I don't know. I, I don't care. Um, I I care that my friends in New Jersey feel you know useless because the the verdict has already been decided for how that state's going to go in in presidential elections or Connecticut or um, you know wherever, and so they have to leave their state to help other Americans because their vote doesn't really matter as much as it does as those of us in Pennsylvania. But I don't take that as a point of pride. That, that's, a, that's a foundational uh, defect that is in the short term benefiting folks to say, hey, pay attention to me as, a, as an elected official, as a candidate, as a party official, um, because otherwise you wouldn't have to pay as much attention to us in the Keystone State. 
that's really a problematic way of deciding um, where to stand on a substantive piece of legislation. So this bill does not have bipartisan support yet on the House side. And it's largely because of the hyper-partisanship that's born out of a, a national culture of divisiveness that has gone, gone on for generations and gotten worse. I used to work in the US Senate in the 90s and um, I moved to a federal commission um, the, the week that Newt Gingrich and, and crew took over um, Congress after a 40 year domination by Democrats. Um, so th this is just a progression that I've seen over the past 25, 30 years and even longer, but it's also because of gerrymandering that we have hyper-partisanship. So I don't think it's appropriate for me to talk in good faith about this particular issue without connecting it to other things that influence how likely or how unlikely it is for it to move forward. So it's not because Democrats are good and Republicans bad. It's not Philly versus the rest of the state. It's none of that stuff. Um, it's structural. There are so many bills I know some of my Republican colleagues would support if those structures were dissolved. And a one example that's highly related to this is there are no campaign finance caps. There's, you could write me a million dollar check if you're a donor. You can't do that for your congressperson. There's a, there's a cap there. But for me, it could be a billion dollars. And take off your private citizen hat and put on a lobbyist hat. You could buy me a summer home. And as long as I disclose it on my financial interest disclosure form, that's okay. You mean to say that how awful those policies are in Pennsylvania doesn't influence how people are gonna to respond to the bill we're talking about right now? Of course it does. It's all related. And what I like to say to anyone, for those of you who are listening in, and this is something you care deeply about, let's say this is your number one issue. And for others, it might be environmental justice or um, childcare or whatever. Your number two and three issues that you have to embrace are electoral reform and may surprise some of you when I say this, media reform. Because how this is talked about, this specific issue or any other issue you care about, how it's talked about in mainstream media influences what people do and how they think more than anything else. And when that's controlled by you know, fewer and fewer people, that doesn't look like democracy to me. We need to, we need to democratize all kinds of spaces, not just the electoral process, not just campaign finance reform, but everything. So all of these things are interconnected. And the best way to be an advocate for this bill is to understand that interconnectedness. Well, may, may I add a little bit to, to that excellent answer? Sure. So I, I, um, I teach math now, but I started off in philosophy and I started off as an ethicist and I have this deep commitment to equality. And so my, my, my commitment to democracy and to voting rights comes out of that. And I started off in actually in gerrymandering. There was, there was a, a, an article in the New York Times in 2013, it's burned into my memory. There was a sentence in there. It was right after the great gerrymander. And it said, you know, in 20, 2012 or 2013, uh, one party won 1.4 million more votes than the other party, but still lost the house by 33 seats. And that was because of gerrymandering. And it's, so I did this deep dive into gerrymandering. I became a speaker. I worked with Fair Districts, which is a wonderful organization. And gerrymandering creates incentives for politicians to become more and more extreme. And then when you fold that in with the fact that, you know, it really is the Wild West with lobbyists at the state level and, and checkbooks. When you fold that all in, we get this, this incredible warping of what should be an actual representation of our, of our will, of our people, of who we are. So, thank you. And we're dropping the, the links to Fair Districts PA and Draw the Lines PA, which is an initiative of the Committee of 70 into the 
into the chat on Facebook right now. Um, we do have a question in the comments that asked, uh, so your bill was, was introduced five years ago. Is there a similar bill in the Senate? Has there been any movement on that side? Uh, we, can, we can be artful in terms of how we define um, movement, um, but I think this is probably a good uh, moment to talk about process so that we understand um, what success looks like and what the barriers are. When you introduce a bill, it's uh, on the House side, the speaker decides unilaterally what committee it goes to. And normally, nine, nine, eight, nine times out of 10, it'll go where any reasonable person would think it would go to. An agriculture bill will go to the Agricultural and Rural Affairs Committee. Um, uh, this bill would go to state government, but it could be referred to another committee. The, the majority chair of that committee decides if that bill will run in his or her committee. Um, and that bill, like most of my bills, languish in committee until they, they die a slow death for you know, the remainder of the legislative term. And if they don't get moved on, you have to reintroduce them. So one of the bottlenecks, one of the most important bottlenecks is uh, the committee level. Will the majority chair on the House side, on the Senate side, agree to move this bill or at the very least have a hearing. The other thing that people need to understand too is, um, I, I forget the, um, uh, the proportionality uh, on the Senate side, but on the House side, um, there are 15 members of the majority party on every standing committee and only 10 on the, in the minority party. Well, why is that important? Well, last time around it was 14 uh, from the a majority party and 11 from the minority party, even though we shrunk the gap, the disparity between Democrats and Republicans, it's majority rule. And so uh, the Republicans said, we wanna give, us, give themselves more leverage. So they increased the number of people from the majority party on standing committees which makes it harder for any bill that's not introduced by a Republican to see the light of day. So movement, um, co-sponsorships is not a good proxy for um, success. You can, and I understand that there is value from a kind of motivational perspective and mobilizing perspective, like how many, how many co-sponsors have we gotten? It is not a one-to-one -one thing. So the most popularly co-sponsored bills are ones that have never seen the light of day, such as uh, the Fairness Act, which would pro extend uh, protected status to our LGBTQ Pennsylvanians. Um, that had at its height over a hundred co-sponsors in the house, I believe, and that has not yet moved. And it will not move in this current political environment. But what we have to do to move us forward is we need to have a diversity of stakeholders, folks like you, folks on the ground, talking to members who are not already kind of oriented to do the right thing and say, this is how you should embrace this bill. This is not a democratic bill. This does not inherently help any particular party or voter. This is how you should process this bill given your political ideology. Because I assure you, um, as a progressive Democrat, I, I, I am not overrepresented in, in this movement. This was started by Republicans. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's important for people to know. This transcends political ideology. Yeah. And part of our strategy on the ground has to be, what is the right narrative spoken in good faith? What is the right framework to approach your state rep, your state senator, or different folks who classify themselves differently, whether they're libertarians, whether whatever, and find a way to do that. And I've had success with regard to the death penalty repeal bill that I'm working on with a very conservative Republican, because we have at least five different strong arguments to make to get different people in different ways. And we have to figure out how we can do that, employ that strategy for this bill. 
So what can so what would you advise somebody who's who's watching at home and they're interested in this issue, they're getting fired up? What is the 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 first best thing for them to do? Is it contact their rep? Is it something else? Uh, great question. Um, so one of the things that is important to know is whether or not your state rep or state senator is even familiar with the bill and familiar with the problem that this bill seeks to correct and disabuse them of any um, uh, misgivings or misunderstanding of the bill. Because some people think that this is a bill that would abolish the electoral college, which as an individual state cannot do. This bypasses it in a constitutional way. That this, and if your state, uh, if your state lawmaker is a Republican, then I would probably lead with that this movement was started by Republicans. This is, is not a democratic thing. This is a nonpartisan. Uh, so it's both bipartisan, nonpartisan, de depending on how you choose to frame it. But let them know who's supportive of it. I brought the former chair of the Republican Party of Michigan to my press conference announcing this bill. You talk about strange bedfellows, but that's what I did to make the point that this is not about how this can benefit Democrats. Um, this is about something that embraces our democratic institutions and our traditions that at least on paper um, um, are lofty and worthy of protecting and, and strengthening. So I, I'd start where, reach people where they are. If you know that I'm a just, like the, the lens through which I look at any policy is through a justice lens, it's best to approach me through a justice lens, right? That's gonna get my attention. For some people, it's gonna be cost savings. For others, it's gonna be um, um, smaller government, right? All kinds of things. And this knowing, doing this due diligence will really help because if you get their attention, and you get them asking good questions, you know you have an opportunity to go back. If they cut you off before you even get there, you know we still have work to do. And um, if I may, Michael Steele, the former head of the Republican Party, did a great interview with Eileen Reeby, who's the, the head of our national grassroots organizing for National Popular Vote on the national popular vote, he is very much um, interested in seeing this pass. And can you tell us if the your national popular vote website has some of these sample arguments or, or text? That, Everything. That oh my goodness, it's wonderful. It's if, if you're wonky, you can just go to wonk town there. there and, and if you're not wonky, there's these great little uh, nuggets, right? So there, there are lots of myths around the national popular vote that if we adopted the national popular vote, then this, the cities would decide who the president is. And, you know, that's based on this, this myth, this idea that, you know, the cities really outweigh the rest of the country. And that's not the case. About one sixth of our population lives in the cities. About one sixth of our population lives in very rural areas. And two thirds of our country is in the suburbs. And, and the suburbs are incredibly competitive politically. They're about half Democratic, about half Republican. Um, and so this idea that if we move to a national popular vote, it would just be the cities. That's completely wrong. And there's the data to support why that's completely wrong on the National Popular Vote website. Um, and there's also a little blurb. So if you're a wonk like me, you can dive into the data. And if you're just someone who said, wait a minute, is that right? You can find something for that too. Nationalpopularvote.com, it's got everything. And I just wanna uh, plug something as a fellow nerd. Um, I love walking out and all of that. Um, the other thing I like about this bill, which, which really appealed to me, is that it's really creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's really yeah. creative because yeah. th there's, there are different ways of achieving the same result, right? And so a lot of people say, oh, we could never um, 
uh, abolish the, the electoral college and, it, da, 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 and so forth. And someone said, you know what? We don't have to. Mm-hmm. Right. It, and so it's, it's not a it's it's not a black and white thing. It's it. We acknowledge the nuances and complexities uh, and and avenues of change to innovate. I love civic innovation. I love civic innovation. I was talking about it long before I was ever crazy enough to run for public office. And then the first bill I get to introduce in 2016 is something so innovative that that honors, it, it, it's not sneaky, it's smart, right? Yeah. So for those folks who want to um, feel a sense of, of pride that there's actually public servants who are embracing creativity to do the right thing in honorable ways to, to achieve a result that actually delivers justice. This is it. I mean, this is, I, you know, as a nerd, I call, I consider this sexy. But yeah, that's, yeah, you know. totally. Oh, yeah, I'm so there. Policy, policy is my love language. There you, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right, and it's, it, you know, laboratories of democracy. Well, this isn't a state, but you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that is a, a phenomenal uh, way, way to think about it too. Something that you had said earlier that had struck me in this discussion about the role of the media. Mm. So right now, it seems to me that the media has a pretty good financial incentive. And logistically, it's easier to say these three, four states are battleground states, and we're going to send all of our people there and amp up the coverage there. So that that feels like a very um, big hurdle in getting the word out about this and having an open, intellectually honest conversation about it. Um, what would you do about that? <laughs> I'm working on a bill <laughs> okay. that oh. would basically cr would incentivize um, corporate media outlets who make a lot of money during election seasons, particularly the last you know couple of weeks, um, to um, use prime time uh, airtime to promote civic literacy. So not promote a particular party, candidate, or cause, but to provide literacy around that so that we can make better informed decisions. And instead of um, um, allowing campaigns and candidates to do negative ads and that sort of thing, because it actually helps candidates who are running in good faith because you're giving more reason to voters to come out and vote. And, um, you know, if, and this is an if, if, you know, media conglomerates care about democracy and we can debate about whether they do or not, uh, then this is uh, feeding two birds in one hand because they would still be able to benefit from a tax incentive uh, instead of all the riches they would get from the political consultants who buy big you know, ad spots and that sort of thing. And it would also uh, increase the literacy of folks uh, watching them. And um, that's important work. But I will say that even though it's really not in the best interest of corporate media to support what we're doing here in the short term, anything that creates a, um, a lot of attention gets eyeballs. So they're gonna make their money one way or the other. And they don't, they're agnostic about what it is. They'll, they'll cover whatever large scale um, uh, outpouring within certain boundaries, I suspect, um, because that's how they get views. Um, but I think it's important to understand that we cannot talk about these issues without understanding the role of the media landscape and the ecosystem and the consolidation of ownership that is decided by public policy on the federal and to a lesser extent, you know, state and local levels. Because um, if they don't have a vested interest in covering these things, because it, it doesn't help the very specific business model of the few people who control the means of, of, of uh, uh, media production, then that, that is a real affront um, to our democracy, just like the Electoral College. Yep. I'm just checking to see if we have any more questions coming in from the chat. Uh, is there anything else we have about, let's call it 10 minutes to wrap up? Is there any kind of concluding remarks as we wait for maybe 
another question or two to come in. Anything that you want, if people learn one thing about the national popular vote and what they can do about it to advance this cause, who do you want to leave them with? Um, okay, I, I'll say this. Uh, it's really important for us to um, build our lobbying muscles as uh, private citizens. You know, that lobbying um, was afforded to us in the Constitution, right? Um, to air our grievances, um, to hold folks in government to account. And I think this is a really good bill to um, flex our muscle and practice the art of citizen lobbying because it's not ideological, it's foundational, right? You can pick another, you could talk about reproductive justice or environment, you know, uh, climate change or whatever, and there could be people on very different sides of those issues. But when you're talking about something like this, you say, well, we're the oldest democracy in the world. Um, we are supposed to be at, at one point the most stable. <laughs> I don't know if that's so true anymore. If we if we um, are endeared to our this mythology about um, America being great, then why are we the only industrialized nation that can't choose our own president directly? Why do we have to be intermediated by this arcane institution that most people, even in public office, do not fully understand? So we, if we get um, um, comfortable with advocating for this bill, this is a non-ideological but very creative bill to talk about our very democracy. And it's a, I think it's a great stepping stone to talk about other issues you care about. And you have the power as a citizen lobbyist to make that appeal to not just your state lawmakers, but to any state lawmaker and ask them, where do they stand on the issue? How aware are they of this issue? Um, what are their hesitations around this? And build that relationship, hold them to account and see how you do. And I'm always interested in helping that. So if, if, if there's a follow-up opportunity to do lobbying around this, count me in. Um, I, I used to do them in person, can do them virtually now, but this is a great opportunity to do this. I want you all to believe that even though we're not moving as quickly ahead as I would like on with this particular bill in either chamber, that could change um, very quickly. But I know it's gonna change uh, with grassroots support. It's not gonna be my eloquence. <laughs> It's going to be folks on the ground doing the work. And that work is really exhilarating. For those of you who are intimidated, who like to be behind the scenes and maybe don't want to go to rallies or this or this sort of, no, this is about connecting with the folks who are supposed to represent us in our commonwealth, our common wealth. And one of the most meaningful forms of community wealth is democracy itself. So I want you to get out of your comfort zone and connect with us and see how we can help you use your own voice and connect with state lawmakers. We'll meet you wherever you are to make the case and, and help me figure out, get intel on my colleagues who say, oh, this person feels this way, this person feels another way, which will help me engage them by you engaging them and us collaborating um, shoulder to shoulder. And I've seen that work before, and I know it can work in this instance. Yeah, and um, I, I just want to add to that, that I have taken that journey. I have gone from being uh, an average citizen, and I am an average citizen, but I, I've taken that step and contacted my state representatives and contacted my, my state senator and my members of Congress. and. And I've actually sat across the desk from them and talked to them and I was really nervous, but it worked out great. You know, you, you, you find out that these are people and that you can talk to them, um, most of them, and um, you can make a difference and it feels great just, just to be part of it. That was a comment I made earlier today in a, in a different program that it's also addicting 
right? Mm. It's a little addictive when you when you when you make that case and you get some positive, you know, forward motion, or you affect your community in a positive way, you get hooked on it. <laughs> I'm so right. glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that. That's a really good point. When people understand, once you realize just how powerful you are, yeah. you're never going to give away that power again. Yeah. I just did something I was extraordinarily intimidated by, and it went fabulously well, or it did better than I had hoped. And they're actually asking me for my opinion now, someone who doesn't even represent me. I get that question a lot, by the way. Should I let them know that they don't represent me? Are they gonna take my call? Are they take my meeting if I'm not their constituent? And the answer to that is, it depends. If you're a true public servant like me, you don't ask them for their zip code as a, as a way to preclude people from engaging you know, a member of, of the Pennsylvania General Assembly. That is bad faith. Many do, even those folks who may not like um, the particular piece of legislation, many of them will have the grace to listen to you. And some may share their candid remarks that you may not like, but that is progress in itself, but it is addicting. When you realize just how much power you have, and particularly when you realize how much power you have collectively, collectively, then that says, well, who else can I bring in? Because the more people I have on this from um, complementary perspectives, the more successful it will be. It is absolutely, I'm so glad you said that, Lauren, because that is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, feeling, a sense of empowerment and progress. Right, and even when you get the pushback, you you at least have your arguments that you know you have to go back and prepare for for the next absolutely. time. So you, you can get something out of every, every one of those interactions. Yeah. Well, um, I so appreciate all of you uh, being here with us. Oh, Beth, do you want to add one more? Yeah, just one last thing. Remember, I just want to make the, the pitch. If you feel a little nervous about talking to your legislator, um, you can always write to them. Uh, they all have email addresses. And, and you, you can also just pick up the phone and call and get a staff person and say, I just want to let you know that I support the national popular vote. And, and there's, a, there's kind of a, a tool at the nationalpopularvote.com which will allow you to write to your legislators. So it, it's pretty easy. It takes a couple of minutes and it'll help. Can I mention two things real quick that are related? Because this is yeah. awesome. This is a great, now, I was going to say this is a great bill, but that seems a little self. <laughs> and, uh, I, I didn't invent the bill. This is model legislation that we adapted for Pennsylvania. There were people who came before me to introduce it. So I don't mean to say it in that way. But what I want to say is there's so much great infrastructure here with the nationalpopularvote.com. There are folks who are going to help you. The, the level of mobilization, the level of substance and care around progress around this bill is almost unparalleled. So if you're a neophyte, if you're new and you want to get your hands dirty in the best sense of that, you know, like farmers, right? You want to grow something. This is a great bill to, to be a part of. Um, secondly, um, you should do all of the above. You should write, you should ask for meetings, you should call, but I want to put a plug in for calling. Here's why. I have an office with a staff of four in my in my district office back home in Philly. I only have a, a few phone lines. If everyone calls at the same time, just for an hour, and says, Rep. Rab needs to support the national popular vote bill, it ties up our phone lines. Well, why do I care? That my staff can't do their work if constituents from all, if, if citizens from all over the Commonwealth are calling me and then my staff gets upset at me. They're like, Rep. Rab, what have you done? What, you need to address these people because we can't deal with other important work until you address these folks who are calling you nonstop. I can avoid an email. We all avoid emails. <laughs> I, we can avoid a lot of things, but when you tie up a phone line, it automatically provides, it creates a level of urgency and a logistical problem for me, for lawmakers, that the only way we can get around is if we say, all right, we'll talk to you, please stop calling, we'll, we'll take a call. 
So there is a logistical and operational benefit of making phone calls to lawmakers who have very small staffs and very few uh, phone lines. So just keep that in mind in terms of strategies and I'm happy to, to lend more help uh, uh, at, at any point. Inside tips, that, that is a good one. That is <laughs> for anyone interested in that. Uh, thank you so much. I learned so much from this presentation and discussion and I'm so grateful that you've been able to join us. Uh, we are right about at time. I do want to send uh, peace and strength to the members of our community who are in the black and brown community and uh, and really holding everyone in, in the light at this uh, critical time. So thank you all for spending some time with us and have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much. <laughs>